In the 1980s, when Nintendo was preparing to enter the Japanese video game home console market with their new entertainment system, Sony, a multinational electronics and television company, had little interest in the sector. Despite Nintendo's success in launching the entertainment system as a toy in the US, one of Sony's engineers, Ken Kudaragi, observed his daughter's use of the Famicom he had purchased for her. He saw the system's potential and realised Sony was missing out by ignoring the growing home console market. When Nintendo contacted Mr. Kuduragi at Sony to provide a wavetable sound chip for their planned follow-up 16-bit system, the Super Famicom, aka the SNES, he leapt at the prospect, viewing it as an opportunity to strengthen ties with the video game giant. Mr. Kuduragi's secret project for Nintendo resulted in the Sony SPC-700 sound chip, a project which sparked outrage within Sony's executive board and led to threats to terminate Mr. Kuduragi. Sony as a company still had little interest in the sector and it was seen as a waste of time and resources. Under pressure, Sony's future CEO and president, Norio Uga, took immediate action. Surprisingly, rather than firing him, Norio Uga recognised the value of the cooperation with Nintendo and gave assistance and financial backing to complete the project. The SPC-700 sound chip was a huge success for Nintendo and in 1988 prompted them to grudgingly agree to a second deal with Sony this time a deal for Sony to develop a CD-ROM add-on for its Super Nintendo Entertainment System, aka Super Famicom, known as the Super Disc. Nintendo considered the CD-ROM to be unsustainable hype. After all, the medium was too sluggish and untested. They saw the Super Disc as only a tiny consumable addition to their much superior cartridge format. Mr. Kutaragi would further reassure Nintendo by stating that the drive would be utilised for everything except gaming. With this guarantee, Nintendo granted Sony a great degree of design control. Sony began developing a dual system similar to that of Sharp's Twin Famicom and NEC's Turbo Duo, one that supported both Super Disk CD-ROMs, which would be exclusively licensed through Sony, and the Famicom Super NES game cartridges licensed through Nintendo. As a result of their deal, Nintendo essentially gave Sony unprecedented complete authority over software licensing, while Sony would continue to develop and maintain control over the Super Disk format. In addition, Sony would be the only recipient of the software licensing for films and music that it was aggressively pursuing as a side project. Since Sony was the only company offering the SSMP audio chip for the SNES and forced developers to purchase its pricey audio creation tool, Nintendo president Harishi Yamachi was already suspicious of Sony and thought it unacceptable. Because of the audio chip, Sony's hybrid PlayStation system and Sony's quick transition from electronics to music, movies and most recently software, Nintendo had grown wary of the company's rapid growth. Nintendo had a suspicion that its console ambitions had turned into a prop. In addition, Yamachi began to view Philips, one of Sony's biggest rivals, as a more beneficial partner. Yamachi dispatched CEO Howard Lincoln and President of Nintendo of America, Arakura, to the Netherlands to countermand the planned agreement and work out a more beneficial contract with Philips. This time, Nintendo would set the terms. All it would have to do was grant Philips' request to use Nintendo characters and a few chosen games on Philips's CDI system. Unaware of this development, Sony finalised the PlayStation prototype ready for the 1991 Consumer Electronics Show, presenting the Nintendo PlayStation to the public on June 1st. Nintendo, on the other hand, had other ideas, announcing their partnership with Philips the very next day at the world's largest electronics expo, entirely humiliating Sony. Sony executives were furious at what was deemed a betrayal by Nintendo. They began ramping up legal action immediately. However, Nintendo and Sony quickly found common ground once more, resuming negotiations to reach a fresh agreement with Sony being given exclusive production of a new CD-ROM add-on for the Super Famicom, aka the SNES. However, once again, the agreement was violated when Nintendo, still uncertain about the future of CD-ROM technology, chose to forego a CD-based system altogether in order to focus on the development of their next big cartridge-based system. 
the Nintendo 64. Sony, with ties now firmly cut with Nintendo, shifted their focus away from the 200 to 300 Nintendo PlayStation Super Disc prototypes. Yes, they did that many. Instead, deciding to use some of that technology to create their very own new next generation console system. In 1994, Sony released their CD format PlayStation to huge fanfare. 16 months later, the Nintendo 64 cartridge home video game console was released. The Sony PlayStation outsold the Nintendo 64 3 to 1. The introduction of the CD-ROM played a huge factor in major influential game developers and publishers switching their alliances to Sony. Compared to CDs, the manufacturing process for cartridges required a minimum of two weeks for every production run. This required Nintendo 64 game publishers to forecast player demand for their titles before they were released if they misjudged the game's success. They may find themselves with an excess of pricey cartridges for a failing game or face a scarcity of copies for several weeks, a huge risk for game publishers. A Nintendo 64 cartridge was also significantly more expensive to produce than a CD. Publishers charge their customers for these costs. The average price difference between Sony PlayStation and Nintendo 64 was $10. Finally, as fifth generation games got more complicated in terms of content, sound and graphics, they began to exceed cartridge storage capacity. Nintendo 64 cartridges could only store 64 megabytes of data, but CDs could hold 10 times more up to 650 megabytes. Nintendo fell behind rivals by underestimating the impact of the CD-ROM format, snubbing Sony's Super Disc partnership twice and backing enormous flops such as the passion project virtual boy it took a decade for them to recover with the release of the nintendo wii ironically a cd-based home video games console thank you for listening